Um, today, uh, we're going to be going through kind of some lessons in Philippians, uh, specifically chapter 3. So I encourage you, if you have brought your Bible or have notes, um, to make note of that or to follow along with me. Uh, we are not going to be going through the whole chapter as you've witnessed me do in the past. Um, I'm actually going to kind of briefly point out a few things, and then we're going to go to the end of chapter 3 for uh, today's particular message. So, um, like I said, take notes or follow along either way. Uh, kind of make this your own study, and I encourage you to go back and find time this week to actually read chapter 3 in its entirety. So, chapter 3 is written by Paul. This is roughly around the time he is in prison. Uh, well, he's in prison, but uh, it's during that time period. And so some of what he says is going to be uh, needs to be understood from that context. But he starts out with mentioning a couple of different people. And the first of these is evil workers uh, or dogs. Uh, dogs, is, it, dogs and evildoers is how the ESV words it. Um, and he's referring to people who are preaching that you must become a Jew before you become a Christian. Right. And so he starts out and he talks about you need to be aware of these people. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh um, for for um, people who, who go through and preach circumcision. And he makes a statement. We are the circumcision. Right. So 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 Paul makes a statement that we circumcision is not what we do anymore. It's who we are. And, and what he's really doing is trying to bring a spiritual understanding to a physical act. In the, in the Old Testament, the Levitical law, the Jewish people circumcised every male, uh, and that was a sign of their covenant with God. And what he's saying is it's not really about the act. It's about who you belong to. But we are those people. That's who we are now. So we don't need the symbol. That's who we are. So we are the circumcision. And not only that, but what what he's also referring to is the um, call to action that Christians now have. Whose responsibility is it to teach people right and wrong? Whose responsibility is it to encourage people to follow the correct path, which we will get to that idea a little bit later, too. Well, he's saying that's our job. We're the ones that circumcise the heart. God's people is he, they are the circumcision itself now. So he says, be aware of the dogs and, and, and he uses this term dogs, which uh, is a term generally used up until this point in reference to um, Gentiles. And we actually see that used quite a bit for uh, Samaritans and people of mixed blood, but it's generally just a term that's used for Gentiles. And so I think it's pretty telling that Paul uses language um, and, uh, you know, believe it or not, slang to reference people who he considers to be not in the covenant. Because of what they're teaching, they're teaching that you must do these things in order to be part of God's law. It means they're actually arguing things that God never actually told people to do. He never, he never once preaches in any of God's word that you must be a Jew in order to be, in order to follow Christ. That's just not something that Christ ever proclaims. So the to, we move down to um, to verse uh, four, and he goes into this argument of of why this is such a problem that you cannot use the flesh as some kind of prerequisite to entering into heaven. And he says, if anyone has, if anyone has validity because of fleshly deeds, it's me. If anyone is righteous because of what, what they've done with their body, it's me. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was raised by the, the Pharisees. I was taught underneath the Sanhedrin. He goes through all of these things and he, he's basically saying, if anyone is righteous because of worldly deeds, it's me. <coughs> But he says, this isn't me. He says in verse seven, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, 
my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Now, I want to take a moment because we we look at the word rubbish and to us it's nonsense or garbage. Uh, But the word actually means refuse or excrement. He's he's saying much more than this is just worthless. He's actually showing a, a form of disgust over it. All of these things that people think make them better than everyone else around them. He's he's saying this is this is refuse. This is excrement. It means nothing in light of what we have gained in Christ. And it, it, as we as we move through Philipp, Philippians, uh, as we move through chapter three and stuff like that, he also at one point references another people. And um, so there's two kind of people he's warning about here. He has the legalist, right? These are the people that are preaching um, circumcision. Uh, and he, he even actually references to it as a mutilation, which uh, if we know our Old Testament, we're told is a practice of the, of the pagans. And it was something that Jews were not called to do. He's now taking this sign of the covenant for the Jews, and he's saying this is actually now a form of mutilation because it's no longer necessary. So now you're just cutting up your flesh. Now, in another book, he's going to reference the same argument when it comes up. He's going to use stronger language, but that's a different lesson for a different time. The second type of people is are going to be the people that um, proclaim that um, – Trying to trying to think of the right way to word this. They're not quite legalists. They're kind of almost the opposite, uh, but not not really liberal as we would usually reference it. Um, but the, these are the people that believe that uh, essentially once you have done these things, once you have provided salvation by works, you 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 are now on the side of Christ. And that's all there is to it. Um, neither one of these is going to work. Neither one of these is in line with what scripture shows us. Now in verse 12, he's actually going to get to the main part of what I wanted to talk to you about. It says, now that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Sorry, not that I have already attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Well, what's he referring to here? If you go right up just to the next verse up, He's actually talking about the resurrection of Christ. He's actually referencing the idea of joining Jesus Christ in death and therein joining Jesus Christ in resurrection. And he's saying, I haven't attained this. I haven't been made perfect yet, but I strive towards it. He says, I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Well, what's another way of saying this? Essentially, if it pleases God, you need to make sure it pleases you. The things that God strives for are the things that you need to be striving for. Why? Because you cannot call yourself one of his children and then trying to chase down the things God doesn't care about. You cannot call yourself one of God's children and then ignore the very things that he structured human history around. You've, all of the all of the things he put in place to make this story happen, to make it plausible and possible for us to be accepted into his kingdom. Right. The idea that that his son has died for our sins, that he was resurrection, resurrected for God's glory and that he ascended to provide us a place that all of these things. These are what God is concerned about. And you cannot call yourself one of God's. And not be concerned with these things, not being concerned with pulling other people from the fire. Because if you call yourself one of God's, you're going to be concerned with the things of God. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I strive to make these things a part of me because God has made me a part of him. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. I, I want to take some time to, do, to kind of pull apart this verse. In verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he, what, what, what is the goal? We often think of the goal as, as um, the same thing as the prize, right? But what Paul is actually suggesting here is the affection, right? We would call that heaven. He actually suggests the reward for, for striving, the reward for trying to do these things is permission to strive for it. And we don't often think about that. We think about when Paul at the end of his life talks about, I have, I have ran the race. I have fought the good fight. We think that running the race is striving towards the reward. And what Paul almost seems to believe is the, the fact that I was allowed to run the race in the first place was my reward. The fact that I was allowed the opportunity to pursue perfection. That was what Jesus died for. That's a beautiful, wonderful thing if you think about it. Outside of Christ, every single time that we have sinned or every time we have gone against the will of God, it breaks the relationship between us and God to a point where it cannot be repaired. Right? You, you, you can't pursue perfection anymore. There's no reason to. You can never attain it. Because no matter what you do, you still have this thing that makes you imperfect. And what he's saying is when, when Jesus has died for us, when we are covered in that blood of Christ, it actually allows us to start pursuing perfection again because it removes those things from us that would hold us back from perfection. And Paul's saying that's, that's a reward for us. That's a great blessing to us. We look at, at, at it as this big work and we have to we have to strive and we have to grind and we have to work so hard our whole lives to, to try to do this. He's saying that the fact that you were even given the opportunity to work towards it in the first place is the greatest blessing you're ever going to get this side of the grave. And we talk about this on Wednesday nights, right? Without Christ, what reason do you have to live a moral life? I mean, Seriously, even if you're under the old law, right? If you're under the old law, what, what reason do I have to try to be better tomorrow? I've already committed a sin. I'm already, I'm already condemned. I'm already damned to hell, right? So what, what reason do I have to ever be better? In Christ, we have that hope. We know that we are forgiven. We know that grace is shown to us. And it's what allows us to wake up every day and commit ourselves to being better than we were the day before. Verse 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And this is this. This is a tough verse sometimes for us because it sounds almost arrogant. I mean, really, it really kind of does. If 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 Dave Engel came up to me and said, you need to join me as we as and, and imitate me. I, I would I would call him pretty arrogant for that. Right. That, that is the first thought and probably the last words out of my mouth in that conversation. Right. But Paul isn't being arrogant in this. He's saying, I'm imitating Christ. I'm pursuing this goal. So you need to come and join me in that. And it's not it's not arrogant because he's not the standard. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about what is the standard that we hold. We when we discussed humility, we talked about the standard. What is the standard that we hold everyone to? Paul isn't arrogant in saying, join and imitate me, because he knows he's not the standard. He's just the one that's figured out what the standard is. Does that make sense? Uh, think about it like um, I'm working on, uh, on a factory line. You have quality quality control or quality technicians, depending on what your job calls them. Uh, they're the people everyone else hates. All right. They're, they're like worse than HR, right? Because HR just tells you you're a bad person. Quality control also tells you you're doing a bad job. Um, 
But basically, quality, quality control's job is to come up, they take whatever you're working on and be like, oh, yeah, this doesn't pass specifications, do it better. And then they, they throw away all the hard work you just did. But the idea here is quality control is not the standard that you're striving for in that job. They're just the ones that know what the standard is. So what, what that means is when they come and tell you this is what it needs to look like, these are the specs that are out of, the, these are the things that are out of specifications, you listen to them. Why? Because they're the ones that know the standard. In fact, half the time, they're the guys that wrote the standard. But it's not because they could do your job. Let's be honest. Most of the time, quality technicians at your job could not do anything that you do. They're just there to tell you that you did it wrong. Right. And Paul's acting in the same capacity. He's not the standard. He's not telling you you need to look like him. He's just the guy that knows what the standard looks like. He's the one that's figured out what perfection is, and he's inviting you to come along with him. We move on with, with what Paul shows in uh, verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's a, that's a massive, massive accusation on somebody's character. To be an enemy of the cross of Christ is to be an enemy of salvation itself. This is their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is that second people, second grouping of people that he's discussing and he, he suggests that God is their belly. What he means by that phrase is they are worshiping the things of the flesh. It's the same people, two different mindsets. These are still, he's still talking about the people that are preaching circumcision. But one group of people is preaching circumcision because they, they are just not of Christ. They just they they have not received the Holy Spirit. They have not received a spiritual understanding of these things. And so they believe that the only way to come through Christ is to go through Israel. And so so they calls them dogs. But these are people that are on a whole different level because they're not just preaching circumcision out of a misunderstanding and out of a, a spiritual immaturity. They're actually preaching circumcision because they worship fe- fleshly works. And that happens a lot, a lot more than we might think. Um, we continuously and constantly raise up fleshly things as the pinnacle standard. Um, we look at uh, America's history with body image issues. All right. Most of the time. What is held as the standard of beauty in America is rarely what is actually healthy, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Obesity is a problem. Being overweight is a problem. I know I'm one of them, right? But, but the thing is, if you look at the standard of beauty throughout America, whether you're going to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it doesn't matter. It is rarely a healthy look. Why? Because that's not what, it, that's not what the standard is for. Because we worship the things of the flesh. We worship being able to see certain body parts on a woman or even on a man, right? Uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you, uh, I've done a lot of weightlifting in my life, um, studied a lot on nutrition. I, I can safely tell you that a man who has a six, six pack is not a healthy man. It's not really something we, we generally talk about or understand, right? Because when we talk about body images, we talk about women. But a man with a six pack is a starving man. That's just the simple truth of it. A man's abs are not actually meant to show. So what, what that actually means is, right, that is a standard of beauty that America has had for a long time. But it's not what's healthy. Why? Because we worship the fleshly. We're not, our standard of beauty has nothing to do with what's healthy. It's based on what, it's based on lust. And these people, these, these people he calls enemies of the cross, these enemies of salvation, they're in this same situation. 
They're actually worshiping a fleshly work simply for the sake of the fleshly work. Where circumcision becomes important in and of itself and not for the spiritual implications of it. We have this problem. Let's leave, let's leave concepts such as uh, body image issues behind um, and, and just talk about works in general. Right. Physical works that we do in our lives that we worship to an unreasonable extent. Um, things like attendance. And that's that has been a big problem. We have preached. We I should I shouldn't say we, but Christians as a whole have preached attendance for salvation for a very, very, very long time. Your attendance, you coming here is not going to save you or get you to heaven. I'm telling I know people that have, that have gone to church much longer than me and just as faithfully. And I can tell you, I don't believe for a second that they're getting to heaven. Because that's not what your salvation is based off of. And you don't you should we shouldn't be lifting up things such as attending a church service to the extent where we believe it's on par with salvation. Church services is nothing more or less than service. It is a way for the body to serve the body for the glory of God. Right? We come together, we sing songs to one another. What are songs supposed to do? Well, we're told to sing songs and hymns and songs of praise to each other. Why? For encouragement. It's supposed to be an encouraging thing that we come together and we sing together and we worship God. Why do we encourage one another? For the glory of God. Because by encouraging one another and worshiping God, we actually lift God up in the minds of everyone who hears it, and we make it something that cannot be ignored. Why do we take communion? Well, same thing. It's a way for the body to serve the body for the glory of God. When we take communion, we remind ourselves and each other about the sacrifice of Christ. We remind ourselves of the gravity of that sacrifice, and we re-cement that um, that commitment, that covenant that we now take part in, we re-cement that in our own minds and in the minds of those who witness it. So what is it for? It's to serve the body of Christ for the sake of God. Everything we do in service is to serve the body of God for the sake of glorifying God. But it's not what saves you. You can actually be saved without any of that stuff. Not a good idea, right? Because you can only go so long without serving your body before your body starves, right? If you don't take care of the body, the body withers away. It's the same thing with your fellow Christians. If you don't come and encourage your fellow Christians, eventually they're going to start to be discouraged. It's a good idea to be in attendance whenever you possibly can. It is generally... Historically speaking, not a good idea to start making excuses for why we don't need to be at church, for why we don't need to be in attendance, for why we don't need to be present in each other's lives. But I can tellfully tell you that your salvation is not based on you being here with me today. We cannot put it on that pedestal. There's not enough room on that pedestal. We worship the things of the flesh, whether it's physical works or physical image, and we worship them to the point where we actually become an enemy to salvation because we lift things up to be so important that they're equal with salvation. Verse 20, Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now, what we're talking about ascension, we're talking about the, the second coming, however you want to phrase that particular event, right? Rapture or whatever phrase you, whatever words you like to use to describe it. We have a great many terms for it. There's a lot of questions I have uh, concerning scripture of what that day looks like. There's a lot of things that just don't really make sense in my own mind. Uh, a lot of questions that I carry with me. 
But what I can tell you is that we are essentially immigrants. It's amazing to me how much we make being an American part of who we are. When the scriptures tell us it's not even where we belong. It's amazing how much of uh, American idealism we allow enter into the equation of what is scripture and what is not scripture. When God tells us you're not even Americans. You're Christians. And if you are children of God, then your place is in heaven. Then your place is in the kingdom of God. And there is no place in the kingdom of God for split, split um, loyalties. Entitled, we will ever gain honor. And we know that one citizen is as good as the next. The question I, I hope that this leaves you with is, is, is just a few minor questions that might be enough to tweak how we look at, at certain things. First of all, do we actually see the opportunity to live a Christ-like life, a reward in and of itself? Or do we see it as a burden? Do, do we actually take time to thank God for the permission to live godly? Or do we just see it as a weighted responsibility? The second is, where is your citizenship today? Where, where, where do you belong? Where's your home? Are you still waiting on it? Or do you believe you've already attained it? Because God kind of tells us, if you, if you think you've already attained it, you have. We're allowed citizenship. And, and, and here's the thing is, uh, this, this still, for some reason, is really difficult for, some, for a lot of people to understand. But citizenship, and, and hopefully using worldly terms will help clarify this in some ways. It, because it's not that hard when we look at how we view the world, right? What do we charge people to become citizens of America? We certainly don't charge them a fortune, do we? No one says, ah, oh, well, if you want to be a citizen of America, you better bring $40,000 because that's the fee to, to, to apply, right? And we, we, we know this because when we talk about illegal immigration, we always say, well, you know, it, we offer, we offer the, the citizenship, we offer legal ways of doing this, right? That's our big argument. But why can we make that argument? Well, because we make it available. If you could pass the test and pay the nominal fee, then you're a citizen, right? And it doesn't take any great work. We don't expect you to, to have a certain level of education. No one expects you to be a, a mechanical engineer in order to be a citizen. We don't expect you to be a, a, a biochemist to be a, a citizen. We don't expect you to have built a skyscraper or to ran a country, right? There's no work that you have to do to qualify. But there are some things that you have to do to claim your citizenship. And one of those is fill out the paperwork, keep the appointments, pledge your loyalty. And really, salvation is not much different. God doesn't charge you this massive fortune. He doesn't expect you to have accomplished certain things in your life. He doesn't expect that you you come to a certain level of education. He doesn't expect you to have have a certain number of accolades or be a certain kind of famous. He doesn't expect a certain number of people to recognize your name and to respect you. What does he ask for? He asks for you to be willing to pledge your loyalty to him, to pledge your life to him, to believe in him. To be willing to die for him as he died for you. 
Like say those words and sometimes it feels like so much weight. So much weight for me to sit here and tell you that you have to be willing to die for God in order to serve God. But the wonderful message of Jesus is that God has never asked his people to do anything he hasn't done himself. What I find is that most men, when they say this, are liars. I have bosses that have said this to me repeatedly, right? I take a job and they're like, well, I don't ask my work to do anything I can't do. Like, really, you can go in there and paint these parts because I've never seen you work a day since I've been here. Uh, You got manicured hands. I know for a fact you're not handling these parts on the line. I know for a fact that you don't even know how to turn the dang machine on because I'm the one that has to come in and do it. Right. So he's a liar because he asked me to do things every day that he's not willing to do. I've certainly never seen him go and join the janitor cleaning up the bathroom. Not the same thing. Foster parents. I had dads all over the place. I don't ask you guys to do anything. I'm not willing to do myself. I've never seen you fold clothes. I had, I had a foster dad. He, it was his famous thing. He said it to every foster kid that came in the home. And I, I never once saw that man push a lawnmower. Most men, when they say that line, are liars. They absolutely ask people to do things they themselves are not willing to do. That's why they're asking you to do it. But God doesn't just say, I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. He went ahead and did all of it before telling you that you had to do it. Right. He, he didn't tell he didn't make the Jews. He didn't talk to the Jews and say, hey, listen, you got to bear a cross for my sake. He went and bore a cross and said, now you do likewise. Right? He didn't say you need to sacrifice your life for me. He went and sacrificed his life. And then he said, now you do likewise. He didn't tell everyone you need to love everyone around you. He loved his children and said, now you go and do likewise. And when he tells you to be baptized for the remission of your sins, he didn't tell you to just go be baptized. He came down and he was baptized. And then he said, now you go and do likewise. It's one of the amazing beauties of scriptures. It does not matter what instruction you go to that came from God. God at no point has ever asked his children to do anything that he didn't do before he asked them to do it. Yeah, I look at I look at the examples I see on earth, and there's a lot of liars, a lot of hypocrites, a lot of faulty people. And I look at the the example from God of a man who never made a mistake and a man who still did every single thing he ever asked me to do. And I have to ask myself, which one am I going to listen to? You can't be the standard because your great reward is to pursue perfection just like me. He's the one I follow because he is the standard. He never needed the reward. He never had to pursue perfection because he is, in fact, perfection. So we want to make an offer for you this morning, as we do every time we gather together. Because we are, in fact, here at service and a capacity to serve one another. And so this morning, uh, if you have any kind of need, whether it be prayers or whether it be an opportunity for confession or whether it be an opportunity to take on the waters of baptism, to, to have your sins and stains removed from you, to join Jesus Christ in his death, burial and resurrection and uh, and eventually join him in his ascension, whatever your needs are this morning. I said you bring them forward and make them known so we can help you see the map as we stand and sing.